Hello everyone, this week we are going to learn how we measure the cost of living for a country. So basically we are going to learn how inflation is calculated. Before we start to learn inflation, let's first make the definition of inflation. Inflation is the increase on average price levels. Now there is a question in front of you on the screen. Try to answer this question on your own. Imagine that the interest rate on your saving account is 1% a year and inflation is 2% a year. After one year, would the money in the account buy more than it does today? Exactly the same or less than today? So when you look at this question, you understand that inflation is much more than the return on your saving account. So on average, the prices of the goods are increasing 2% while your money grows only 1%. Therefore, you are going to buy less amount of goods and services if your return on the money is less than inflation. So this is one example that why inflation is important. We need to understand inflation to make right financial decisions. Here on the screen, you see the picture of Babe Ruth's. Babe Ruth's salary in 1931 was 75,000. And today, average baseball player salary is 4 million. So one another important point why we learn inflation is to be able to compare the dollar values from different times. 75,000 was earned in 1931. Today is 4 million. Now we know that in 1931, the cost of living was cheaper. House prices, foods and everything was much cheaper compared to today. So in order to make the right comparison, we need to convert $75,000 that was earned in 1931 to today's dollars. And to do that, we are going to use BLS government inflation calculator data. BLS government inflation calculator is actually very helpful because what you are going to do is clicking on the link, which you will do, I think, which you can do at home and then type over there 75,000 and the time it was earned, which is 1931, and then convert to 2022 values. And when you do that, you'll see that the Babe Ruth is earning approximately $1 million. So on average, baseball players are now earning much more compared to the earnings of the baseball players in the past. If we understand why inflation is important, the next question is how we calculate inflation. Before we calculate inflation, we need to first understand the price indices. The first one is consumer price index or CPI. CPI measure of the overall cost of goods and services bought by a typical consumer. And CPI is used to monitor changes in the cost of living over time. Core CPI, on the other hand, a measure of the overall cost of consumer and consumer goods and services, excluding food and energy. So the question is why we exclude food and energy. These two items are very volatile. So after we subtract the food and energy, we want to know on average how much the consumer's basket cost is increasing over the years. So CPI is a basket and in this basket you have 80,000 goods. Okay. It includes housing, it includes car, it includes health insurance premiums and everything that an average household spends on a month. And then using this basket, you come up with an indices. Producer price index, PPI, is a measure of the cost of basket of goods and services bought by firms. This basket this time is actually bought by firms. So the difference between PPI and CPI is who buys this basket. For CPI, it's consumers. For PPI, it's producers. So first we learn how to calculate CPI and then we will learn how to calculate inflation rate. We have steps. The first step is fix the basket. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS, surveys consumers to determine what is in the typical consumer's shopping basket. And then BLS fixes this basket. After the survey, the goods and services determined, then this basket is used over the years. And next, BLS finds out the prices of each item in the basket. And then BLS compute the basket's cost. And next, BLS chooses a base year and computes CPI. Choosing a base year is designating a year as base year, which is the benchmark. So CPI is equal to basket's cost current year, let's say cost of basket in 2022 divided by cost of basket and the base year. 
and times 100. CPI represents the average price of these basket. And after we calculate the CPI, we compute the inflation rate. Inflation rate is a percentage change in the CPI from the preceding period. So inflation rate is CPI this year, let's say this is 2022, CPI last year 2021 divided by CPI last year 2021 times 100. You can use a simpler formula to calculate inflation rate. If we say inflation rate is pi, CPI this year, which is 2022, divided by CPI 2021 minus 1 times 100 will give you the same result. So these two formulas are the same. One might be easier for you to remember than the other. Now, in order to understand these steps, we need to do an example. And here, the first step starts with fixing the basket. And we fix the basket. That means consumers are buying 10 pieces and 5 shirts every year. So always in the basket we have 10 pizzas and 5 shorts. Quantities are fixed. And then we find the prices of pizza in 17 and then 18 and 19. And this, we do the same thing for price of shirts. We find the prices which is step 2. And step 3 is calculating the cost of basket given the quantities here. So it's going to be here 12 times 10. Why? Because we have 10 pizza here. Plus 18 times 5 because we have five shirts. And the cost of basket in 17 is 210. We do the same for 18 and 19, but the prices are different, quantities are fixed. 14 times 10 plus 20 times five, which is 240 in 2018. And the cost of basket is 270 in 2019. If we assume that the base year is 2017, which is our step four now to calculate inflation, we need to choose a base year. In this case, 2017 is designated as a base year. Now we can calculate the CPI for each year. Remember, CPI in each year, you have the 100, and then cost of the basket in 17, which is 210, divided by cost of basket in base year. So what we learn here is that for base year, always the CPI is 100, because cost of basket of the year and the base year are the same. In 2018, 100 again starts with 100, and then cost of basket in two, 2018 divided by cost of basket in the base year, 210, and then CPI is 114.3. 2019, 100 times 270 divided by 210, and that's equal to 128.6. So these are the CPI indices that we find for every year. The final step is to calculate the inflation rate. Inflation rate is a change in the CPI from one year to another. So if we are interested in inflation in 2018, we can calculate 2018 inflation by subtracting 2017 CPI, which is 100, from 2018 CPI divided by CPI 2017 times 100. So CPI this year, because this is the inflation for 2018, this year is 18, CPI 2018 minus CPI 2017 divided by CPI 17. And that's how we calculate the inflation rate. The, the same formula we use for the inflation rate for 2019. So this time we are looking at inflation in 19 and it's a change from 18 to 19. Therefore, we have here CPI 19 minus CPI 18 divided by CPI 18. And that gives us 12.5% increase in prices from 18 to 19. So let's do one example to make sure that we understand CPI basket. CPI basket includes 10 pounds of beef and 20 pounds of chicken. And the prices of beef and chicken are given on the screen. And base year is 2017. We calculate CPI for all years. And then we calculate the inflation rate from 18 to 19. So I want you to stop this video and then try on your own. And in the next slide, I'll show the solutions. Okay, welcome back. Now we need to calculate CPI for all years. We need to find the cost of basket for all years. And we know that each basket has 10 beef and 20 chicken. So 3 times 10 plus 3 times 20, $90 is the cost of basket in 17. 
Then 4 times 10 plus 4 times 20, as you see the quantities are all fixed, $120, the same basket, cost in 2018. And 19, the same basket cost 180. And now we need to find a consumer price index for each year, which in this case, for the base year, it's 100. You don't need to even calculate. For 2018, you start with 100. Cost of basket this year, which is 2018, 120, divided by cost of basket in the base year, 90, which is equal to 133.3. In 19, 100 times cost of basket in 19, 180, divided by cost of basket in the base year, 90. So CPI, 19 is 200. Now let's calculate the inflation. Remember, inflation in 19 is CPI 19 minus CPI previous year, 18, divided by CPI 18 times 100, which is 50%. The increase in inflation from 18 to 19 is 50%. Is there any shorter way to answer this question? Yes, for the part A, we have a shorter way. Instead of we calculate the CPI, we directly calculate the cost of basket in 18 and 19 and find out the percentage change in the cost of basket instead of CPI. So how we calculate 2018 cost of basket? We take the $4 times 10 plus $4 times 20, which is 120. And for 19, 8 times 10 plus 5 times 20, which is 180. Now, let's calculate the change in cost of basket from 18 to 19. Okay, how we are going to do that? It's very simple. Now we are calculating the inflation in 19. Inflation in 19. Cost of basket in 19 is 180 minus cost of basket in 18 is 120 divided by cost of basket in 18 is 120 times 100. Now let's calculate that this difference is 60. 60 divided 120 times 100 is again 50 percent. So you can skip the CPI calculation and still get the inflation rate for 19 by using cost of basket instead of CPI. Now we have another example here. We have 5 pounds of beef and 25 pounds of chicken. So what happens is that in 2019, as you see, beef prices increase, right? Double. Because of that, consumers substitute beef with a cheaper alternative, which chicken prices increase too, but not as much as beef. So for that reason, the amount has changed. We are going to first calculate cost of the new basket for 2019 and the CPI for 2019. So what this question is saying that in 17 and 18, the amounts were still 10 pounds of beef and 20 pounds of chicken. But when we come to 2019, consumers substitute beef with chicken. Therefore, chicken amount increase, beef amount decrease. So we are going to calculate cost of the new basket for 2019 and the CPI for 2019. So cost of basket will be $8 times 5 plus $5 times 25. This is the new basket, new cost of basket. Next, we will calculate the CPI and then we will calculate the new inflation rate. The cost of basket, as you see, for 17 and 18 doesn't change. It's $90 and 120. But because the quantities are different in 19, now the new cost is 165. And if we calculate the consumer price index, consumer price index is 100 for the base year, 133.3, which we have found in the previous question. Now we are going to find new consumer price index for 2019, which in this case is CPI in 2019 divided by the base year times 100, which gives us 183.3. And the inflation rate with the new CPI is going to be 183.3, which is CPI in 19 minus CPI in 18 divided by CPI in 18 gives us 37.5 percent. So as you see the inflation is actually as is not as high as 50 percent because people when the price of one good increases they substitute with the cheaper alternative. So the next topic that I want to talk about is some fallacies people think about inflation. 
This is your discussion assignment, so I want you to first watch the videos and think through it and think through the definition of inflation and then think about how we measure inflation by watching the second video. So in this video, when you watch it, you realize that meat prices, college tuition are rising 18%, but we don't see an increase in inflation 18%. We usually see at that period of time 1% or 2% inflation. So are we doing something wrong? It's actually we are not doing something wrong. This can be explained by how do we measure inflation. When you look at the inflation basket, the biggest component is the housing. Because if you just look at your wage or salary, the most component of salary, mostly one third, even more than one third, goes for rent or mortgage payments. And the second component is transportation, which is 16.7% of consumers' budget in a month. And then food and beverages, 14.2%, and so on. As you see, there are many goods in this basket. And when you calculate the change in prices, you take in weighted average and most weight is given to housing. So when housing prices increases, then the inflation increases more. Why? Because the weight of housing is high in the inflation basket. But food and beverages have only 14.2%. So this is the one reason why you don't see the increase in food, on, food and beverage 18% directly into the inflation basket because there is a weight of the food and beverage. Second, in the economy, some good prices are increasing. Let's say meat increases 18%, but cereals drop by 3%. So inflation is an increase in average prices. When you average out the food prices, maybe the increase in food category as a category, not only single items, might be 4 to 5%. And then this 4 to 5% is not directly affecting the inflation, only 14.2% of it affects the inflation rate. So this is the reason uh, why people think that the inflation rate doesn't reflect the cost of living when you go to a grocery store. So as we talk about GDP, GDP is not a perfect measure. CPI inflation is not a perfect measure too. There are problems with measuring inflation rate. The first one is substitution bias. Over time, some prices rise faster than others. Remember, we did the example when the beef prices are rising, people are switching the chicken. So in this case, the actual cost of living of the people households are not increasing as much as, as the CPI is calculated. Why? Because CPI is always assuming there is a fixed basket, but actually people switch to cheaper alternatives and consumers substitute toward goods that become relatively cheaper, mitigating the effects of price increase. The CPI misses this substitution because it uses a fixed basket of goods, thus the CPI overstates increase in the cost of living. The next problem with CPI is the introduction of new goods. The introduction of new goods increases variety, that means you have more different types of goods that you can choose from. And if you don't like one, you can find a substitute that closely meets what you need from that product or service. In effect, your dollars become more valuable, but CPI misses this effect because it uses a fixed basket of goods, thus the CPI overstates increases in the cost of living. And finally, unmeasured quality change. Improvements in the quality of goods in the basket increase the value of each dollar. The BLS tries to account for quality changes, but probably misses some, as the quality is hard to measure. For instance, the quality of the cars are increasing, but sometimes the price of the car doesn't increase that much, that reflects the change in quality. Thus, the CPI overstates increases in the cost of living. So, all these problems are overstating. That means the CPI inflation is actually higher than what actual inflation is, contrary to what street people think. So, we have two measures of inflation. And we learned consumer price index inflation, that inflation based on consumer price indices. And there is another one which we learned in the previous chapter is the gross domestic product or implicit price deflator. Gross domestic product uses GDP deflator. Remember, GDP deflator is a price indices too. GDP deflator to calculate the inflation. And when you look at over the years, the red one is GDP deflator and consumer price in, uh, index inflation. 
They follow each other, but there are some differences, like here, for instance. There is a difference between the calculation of inflation with GDP deflator and consumer price index. And you see another difference here. And you see, so we now are going to learn why these two indices produce us two different inflation at some. So in GDP deflator, imported consumer goods are not included, but CPI includes that because these are consumer goods. For instance, French wine is in CPI, but French wine is not in GDP deflator because of the definition of GDP. GDP says that all goods and services produced in the country, not outside the country, therefore imports are not included in GDP deflator. If there is a huge increase in an imported goods, then CPI inflation for sure will be higher than GDP deflator inflation. The second one is the capital goods. Capital goods are excluded from CPI. Why? Because capital goods are not consumer goods. A farmer buying a tractor is not a consumer good, it's a capital good. But they are included in GDP deflator. Why? Because investment includes capital goods and if they are produced domestically. Therefore, we might see differences in inflation rates that are calculated CPI and GDP deflator. And the next difference is the basket itself. CPI is a fixed basket, prices of all goods and services bought by consumers. GDP deflator is actually changing every year. Prices of all goods and services currently produced domestically. So let's, let's look at this example. In each scenario, determine the effects of the CPI and the GDP deflator. The first one, Starbucks raises the price of muffins. Let's think about Starbucks and the muffin. Is this muffin in CPI basket? Yes, it is because it's a consumer good. Is this muffin in the GDP basket? Yes, it is because it is produced in the current year. For that reason, both inflation rates are going to increase and reflect this change. Next one, Caterpillar raises the price of the industrial tractors it manufactures at its Illinois factory. In this case, these tractors are not a consumer good, therefore it's not in CPI basket, but these tractors are in the GDP deflator. So the change in price will be in GDP deflator inflation rate, but not in CPI inflation rate. Next one is Armani raises the price of Italian jeans it sells in the US. Italian jeans are an imported product, import, therefore it's not in GDP, but it's actually in CPI. Why? Because it's a consumer good. Therefore, the change in the price of our many jeans are going to be in CPI inflation rate, but not in GDP deflator inflation rate. Now let's talk about indexation. So we know that inflation may distort the prices, may distort the values that we think about. For that reason, in order to protect ourselves because of this distortion, we use indexation. What is indexation? A dollar amount is indexed for inflation if it's automatically corrected for inflation by law or in a contract. The increase in CPI automatically determines adjustment in social security payments and federal income tax brackets. So you know that most people are getting social security checks uh, when they retire. And these amounts, if they are not increased by as much as the inflation, then their purchasing power is going to go down because their income is not going to buy the same number of goods and services over the years. In order to protect these people's earnings in terms of purchasing power, we actually index the increase in social security payments to increase in inflation. So if the inflation increases by 2%, then social security payments are also increasing by 2%. The idea is to keep the purchasing power of these people secure and stable. And the next thing that we are going to talk about is real and nominal interest rate. So nominal interest rate is the money interest rate. It's the interest rate when you deposit your money in a bank and this nominal interest rate does not correct it for inflation and it shows the rate of growth in dollar value of a deposit or debt. So if you put $1,000 in a bank and the bank pays 5%, then $50 is the growth in dollars after one year. The real interest rate, on the other hand, is corrected for inflation and it shows a rate of growth in the purchasing power of a deposit or debt. 
So real interest rate is nominal minus inflation rate. For instance, if nominal interest rate is 5%, but inflation is 3%, then your real rate is 2%. You are getting out the growth in prices and find actual increase in purchasing power of a deposit or debt. Sometimes this is confusing. Let me explain this with an example. So let's say you have $100 and you can buy this year, let's say t is equal to zero. At year zero, you have $100 and you can buy with $100 10 books, each $10, okay? And then at t is equal to one, one year later, if you deposit this money into bank, the bank pays 10% interest rate, so your total amount of money becomes 110. This is the nominal rate. And let's assume the inflation rate is zero, so the books are still 10. And as you see, you can buy 11 books if there is no inflation. So what happens here is that the purchasing power of your money also increases by 10%. Why? Because you were buying 10 books, now you are buying 11 books, a 10% increase in your purchasing power. This is your real interest rate. Real interest rate, remember, shows how many more goods and services you can be able to buy with the growth in your deposit. And how do we find real interest rate? Nominal rate, which is 10%, minus the inflation rate, and it's 10%. Now let's look at another example. This time, again, t is equal to zero. You have $100, and the books are $10, and you can buy 10 books at t is equal to one, your dollars become 110 because you are getting a 10% nominal rate, but the books increase $11. So what happened here? We have an inflation rate of 10%. So the book prices are increasing by 10% and the nominal rate also 10%. Now let's look at your purchasing power. You were buying 10 books at t is equal to zero. Now you, were, you, you are buying again 10 books at t is equal to one. So you, your real return or the growth in purchasing power is zero. We can see that from the formula, real interest rate is equal to nominal minus inflation zero. So this is very important when you make financial decisions because it's possible that a bank may offer you a financial instrument, may offer you 10% increase, but the inflation is 30%. You are actually losing your purchasing power by depositing your money to get 10% nominal return. That means you are buying less goods and services because of the inflation rate. So here we have one example. Amir received 1,000 end of year bonus at his job. He deposits this 1,000 in his saving account for one year. The nominal interest rate is nine. During that year, inflation is 3.5%. At the end of the year, is Amir able to buy more or fewer goods with his money and how much? The answer is, real interest rate. We need to find real interest rate if we want to know whether he can buy more or fewer goods. How we calculate real interest rate? Nominal interest rate minus inflation. 9% minus 3.5, 5.5%. The purchasing power of the 1000 deposit has grown by 5.5%. And let's look at real and nominal interest rates over the years between 1965-2019. And as you see, nominal interest rate is about the real interest rate uh, most of the time. The reason is simple, I believe, because of the inflation rate. When there's inflation, nominal rates are higher than real rates. But here, when you come after 2010, when the nominal rates are reached to zero lower bond, we see a negative returns, negative real interest rates. So this is the end of this chapter. Thank you.